fellow rowers and any other endurance athletes that are finding this video uh, today I want to talk with you guys about strength training and just give a couple of strength training basics that I think can really elevate your guys performance whether you are a rower or an athlete in other sport because uh, the topics that we're going to cover today really are applicable across uh, any endurance sport and there's going to be three uh, specific points that I want to talk about and the first one I'm going to talk about is the timing of when you're doing your strength work with a specific emphasis on avoiding injury. And more specifically, when I'm coming to this topic, I have in mind youth coaches that will tend to uh, set up their practices in a way where they might have a group on the water and a group on land doing some strength uh, just because of limited coaching or limited equipment and they would be flipping those athletes so that maybe a group is starting out with strength and another group is starting out either on the indoor rowers or actually on the water and then at the end of practice or the second half of practice those groups switch. And the issue with that is that in rowing one of the major causes of injury are muscular imbalance, all right? And so you'll get injuries, let's say in the ribs, because your chest is not strong enough to handle the muscles, the strength of the muscles in the back, which are very well developed through the rowing stroke. And in, in the case of the ribs specifically, if you are weak kind of in the intercostals or in the obliques uh, and in the pectoral range, and you're constantly in that rowing motion where you're really flexing the lats. Essentially, you're kind of pulling back all those muscles are flexing. They're pulling back on your rib cage. And if you don't have enough strength on the front of your rib cage to balance that pull, um, then it will actually be a pull. So it will actually, instead of just kind of, you know, being countered that, that that contraction of your muscles being countered by the muscles in front of your body, uh, it's gonna pull on your rib cage. And if you do that tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of times without strengthening uh, those muscles in front, then eventually you're gonna develop uh, a stress fracture in your rib and you might actually break a rib if you have the pain tolerance to actually row through a stress fracture. Um, and that idea extends to all the other muscle groups on your body. So a lot of time, you know, back injuries, lower back injuries in particular are big issues for rowers. Um, and those are owing to maybe inflexible hamstrings, uh, particularly a weak core that's not able to, again, balance uh, the work of the back through that, through that rowing stroke. Um, when I was a runner, I had a lot of issues with shin splints, um, and that's certainly common amongst other runners, uh, distance runners, and that was really um, an imbalance of strength between the front of my leg and the back of my leg, my calves. And it wasn't until a coach had uh, had me start doing toe lifts um, to strengthen up that front of the leg that those shin splints uh, were able to go away. But coming back to the point is that when you are in a, an endurance sport, particularly a power endurance sport like rowing, those main muscles that you're using in those activity, if they're not properly balanced, then that is a recipe for injury. And I'll hear coaches in rowing um, say that, you know, something like, uh, don't do the bench press. The bench press is useless in rowing. And, and that just kind of makes me pull out my hair. And so you can see how many of those coaches I've heard say that. Um, but uh, it is, it, it infuriates me. Those coaches are just uh, destined to injure a lot of their athletes because they don't understand the concept of balancing their musculature. And so sure, the bench press is not going to create a direct impulse or it's not gonna work the muscles that create direct impulse in rowing, but it is going to balance um, the muscles that do so that you're not getting injury in those ribs. And for me particularly, I've been lucky enough to kind of get through most of my career without any really rowing related injuries. And the closest I got was uh, when I started to develop kind of pain in my intercostals when I was training a lot of volume for the first time as a junior in college. And, um, and yeah, and I started to feel that, that stress there and I backed off and it was, it was peculiar because it was actually only an issue on the water. It was not an issue on the erg, which is kind of a testament to the fact that the erg is, is really cross training for rowing. It's not 
it's not the same thing. Most of it's the same, but there's definitely uh, important differences. And essentially for me, it was the, the position of taking the load with my hands out versus my hands in is what was stressing the muscle in question. Um, and at that time I was doing a lot of bench press um, in addition to rows and squats, deadlifts, all that fun stuff. And I actually, I stopped rowing for a while. I just did some erging, I kind of backed off. And, and then I started to work on an incline bench press instead of a standard bench press. And I found that that more directly uh, worked the muscles um, that were uh, getting weak or were weak and were contributing to that, that potential stress fracture, that building stress fracture that I was developing the ribs. And th that was interesting in the specific specificity because if you think about it, when you're doing an incline bench press, you are relative to the horizontal plane, you're in a forward body angle, all right? So if I was sitting forward, like I would taking the, the load at the catch and rowing, and I simply transfer that, you know, what was it, 45 degrees or so, 90 degrees, um, then essentially that means that my arms are like this relative to the front of my body. And so therefore I was, with the incline press, I was directly working the muscles that were being engaged through uh, the front end of the stroke. But, um, again, trying to come back to, to this idea is that um, if you do lifting, uh, especially like just kind of light circuits or even kind of heavier lifting right before you do an endurance session, so in this particular case in rowing, so if you do, let's say, a bunch of push-up squats, deadlifts, ab work, ab work especially right before getting into your rowing session, then you, what you're doing is you are, is you are sure you're going to be strengthening those muscles that you are working for the rowing and those muscles are going to be a little bit more tired, but more importantly, you're creating fatigue in the muscles that counterbalance your primary movers in the body. You need those muscles to be able to balance those primary movers to reduce the probability of injury. And so if you're specifically stressing those, you know, and we'll use push-ups as an example. So if you're doing, or abs, let's say you're doing a lot of core work. If you're doing a lot of push-ups or you're doing a lot of core work before you get out on the water for a rowing session, or even if you're uh, in any sport, if you're gonna weaken your abs before doing your core, that's gonna put your back in a very vulnerable position because your, your core is compromised in its ability to balance the, the strength of those uh, back muscles when they're being engaged. And in the case of your upper torso, your push-ups are going to weaken those counter muscles in your chest um, so that they're not able to balance the work that you're doing with your back muscles in that rowing stroke. And so for athletes and coaches out there, if you're going to do like a little bit of strength work in within the essentially the same training session as your aerobic work, you need to be doing those after the aerobic work, all right? And this isn't to be confused with doing like, you know, one little set of push-ups, a little set of squats, just to kind of get the muscles warmed up and activated. I'm talking about actually doing a strength training session that will create fatigue, create a training stimulus, and then going on and doing your aerobic work afterwards, all right? And so, simple things. So if you're a coach, and, and I've been in that situation. You have limited manpower, you have limited equipment, and hopefully you have a lot of athletes involved and you've got to figure out a way to kind of balance them and keep everybody working and engaged. And one of those is simply to partition your group and have one do one thing and one do another. But um, as a coach, you need to be very, very careful about having a, that group that is doing the strength training first and then moving directly into that aerobic work, either on, a, on an indoor rower, on the water, if you're in the sport of rowing, or any other sport. So that's number one. That was the main, that was the main topic that brought me up today. But there's two others that I also want to talk about with strength training. The next one is that for me with strength training, I've spent a majority of my career teaching young athletes or adult athletes that are really just getting into the sport for the first time. So really novice, novice adults, not kind of like post-collegiate, um, you know, adults that have been rowing for a long time and have just, you know, aged out of college or high school. So with those athletes, the, the majority of my time is really focused on one, improving their efficiency in the stroke and then developing a base level of fitness. 
And so I always look at it as a, as a cost benefit analysis when I'm thinking about what I want to spend my time doing with that level of athlete. And, and for me, you know, doing a ton of cross training is not going to be nearly as beneficial for the development in rowing as getting time on the erg, on the water, um, actually learning the skill of moving the boat. And so if I was using cross training, um, not including lifting, that was usually to keep them mentally fresh and also just to get uh, the body moving in, in a non-linear fashion for rowing, which is very forward and back, and trying to amazingly condition those muscles for non-linear movement to avoid injury. But in the sense of strength training, um, if I have an athlete that's, that's only has you know five or six training sessions a week, then you know dedicated strain training workouts are not a very good use of my time and so i would say until you start getting athletes that are putting in let's say maybe nine ten or more training sessions a week are you really going to benefit in a cost benefit analysis to take an entire training session or in the case of strength training you really need at least two maybe three complete training sessions during a week to really develop um, maximal strength and power and to develop that, that aspect of the body with training. If you're below that, certainly if you're in a, if you're, you know, training two, three, five, six times a week, then dedicated strength training days are not going to be um, extremely beneficial if your goal is competitive performance in the sport. That being said, I did do strength training ideally um, twice a week, which I felt was the minimum to create a positive adaptation. I would always do it after the, the main training session, as I mentioned earlier in this video. And a lot of times I would do it um, kind of paired with a lighter aerobic recovery day after maybe a hard interval session or maybe a very long challenging aerobic uh, row. And um, with that training, it was generally all in what I call the anatomical adaptation training phase. All right, so you know a lot of my understanding of strength training comes from Tudor Bompa in his book uh, Periodization Training for Sports, and in that book, Bompa does a great job of of setting up the different kinds of strength training. And so you have anatomical adaptation training, you have maximal strength training, you have power. You have muscular endurance training, you have hypertrophy training, uh, which uh, is not going to be useful for rowing, but may be useful for some other sports, maybe like a football where mass is important. Um, but in rowing, it was really focused around anatomical adaptation, maximal strength, power, and muscular endurance. And I actually found that power was better developed outside of the weight room. Um, and more in rowing for my own use uh, as, a, as a lightweight rower. And, but that anatomical adaptation I think is a phase that a lot of people neglect or don't even understand. And what it is is that your muscles gain strength at a very high rate proportional to the connective tissue to your tendons and ligaments. And so muscles are very highly adaptable but your tendons and ligaments not so much. And so what the anatomical adaptation phase does is it your loading is very small and so you might be lifting somewhere between 30 and 50, maybe at the top end 60% of your maximal lifts and you're going to be lifting them somewhere in the, in the 12 to 20 rep range and you're not going to be lifting to failure or to a high stress you're lifting to what I would call would be discomfort to where you really kind of start to feel the work and then that that point that inflection point in your effort where you really start got to start to focus and really kind of push through that discomfort to continue your lift and so with that anatomical adaptation phase you're lifting relatively low weight and you're doing it in a relatively higher rep range and you're not doing it to failure or even to a high stress and what that does is it's still develop, it's still higher than normal loads. And so it's still conditioning your tendons and ligaments to, uh, to, to be prepared for the strain training that's gonna come later in your, in your periodization, later in your annual cycle. And for a less experienced athlete, you really should be spending 12 to 15 weeks 
within anatomical adaptation before you progress into a uh, maximal strength or power training phase. Maximal strength probably being the better one to transition directly from anatomical adaptation for rowers. Um, and uh, if you're not a rower, you might not need maximal strength at all. Uh, you might just go directly into a muscular endurance phase. But the the idea being is that for that less experienced athlete, you know, 12 to 15 weeks in the anatomical adaptation, if you're an athlete that's been doing strength training for several years, that may come down to only maybe four to six weeks uh, spent in the anatomical adaptation phase. And, and you, for that experienced athlete, you might be doing more in the 40 to 60 percent of your max whereas the less experienced athlete will be spending a lot more time in the 30 to 50 percent of their max lift for that adaptation training but you're doing that training and it's developing your your connective tissue and it's basically giving that connective tissue a head start on what's going to come later with your maximal strength all right and once you start your maximal strength your muscles are going to get um, really strong really fast all right because muscles are very adaptable for uh, training stimulus and the great thing about that well one is that you know if you're coaching youth athletes you should be spending a lot of time on the anat anatomical adaptation but the other benefit is that the muscles are still going to start to strengthen in that phase you're just not putting them under high stress and so there is this great side benefit that I would find in that whenever you're doing an activity, even if maybe you're getting into the rowing for the first time after a long break or starting any other sport for the first time after either not doing it before or after a long break, the initial benefits, the initial improvement curve is way steeper than what it's gonna be later on, all right? So you're essentially gonna have this curve coming up and then you're gonna to start to approach an asymptote of whatever your peak you know, potential is gonna be. All right, and with the anatomical adaptation training, what I found was that it, it was enough to basically train the muscles within that, that initial huge steep curve where you're getting a lot of benefit strength-wise for a relatively small amount of work and then once you get past that inflection point, suddenly you start to have to do a lot of work for relatively small benefit. And that's why I was saying earlier is that if you are, um, if you're not training 10 or more sessions a week, then you're gonna get benefit more by focusing your time in the, in the rowing, the sport specific activities. Um, before you know, devoting entire training sessions is gonna help you more than just getting extra aerobic volume. So and when you're doing that, you know, 10, 12 plus training sessions a week, then yeah, you can try to get past that inflection point and get yourself closer to that asymptote of your potential. But for the vast majority of us, I would say at least 90, 95% of us in the sport of rowing or even any other endurance sports, if we can kind of get us past that initial that initial huge benefit in strength training relative to doing nothing at all, then that is gonna be a huge return for our time uh, because it's not gonna take a whole lot of time. We're talking maybe 20 to 30 minutes twice a week after your primary training session. At the most, if, you're, if you have the time, 40 to 45 minutes twice a week is gonna really carry you up that initial gain of strength training. And so whether it's for a youth athlete um, that's only training five or six times a week, whether it's an adult athlete that has other time issues, or whether it's just a recreational athlete that only wants to be training two, three, four, five, six times a week, then um, spending that 20, 30, up to maybe 45 minutes doing anatomical adaptation training is gonna be immensely beneficial for your performance. And, and for rowing in particular, I usually say if you can't do um, a couple sets of 40 or 50 body weight squats without being sore the next day, then you really need to be adding some kind of basic strength training uh, to your lift. And that's, I think, true for any, any movement pattern. And the beauty about anatomical adaptation as well is you don't need uh, you don't need plates. You don't need squat racks. You know you can do it generally with body weight. Um, you can do it maybe with lighter dumbbells, and you're going to get that percentage of max covered um, to get the training benefit. So for me, uh, in particular, um, I use 
uh, calisthenics, and so I'll use push-ups, bodyweight squats, dips, uh, handstands, um, I'll do L-sits, uh, crunch it, any kind of ab work is gonna help in that adaptation phase. Uh, one thing that is characteristic of that adaptation phase is it's beneficial to do a lot of different exercises. And so I would say pick between 10 and 15 different exercises that hit all of the muscles, all right, that and hitting both your primary movers for rowing, that would be your backs, your quads, uh, maybe your triceps there, as well as your balancing muscles, so your pectorals, your hamstrings, your biceps. Um, for that anatomical adaptation, and that is going to give you a lot of benefit into your both your performance and injury prevention. And now the third point I wanna talk about is dispelling this idea that being sore after a hard training session is a good thing, all right? Being sore is an indication of a failed um, training progression or, or a failure in creating a, a good periodization of your training, a good pattern of stress and recovery. Essentially that, that additional fatigue, that soreness is a maladaptation where if you're, you super stress the body and then you're going to require an equally proportional amount of rest to recover from that. And then that rest, that additional rest that you're needing is going to interfere with your ability to train consistently. And if you're an, if you're an endurance athlete and strength training is creating fatigue or soreness that's going to get in your way of, of training aerobically and training your, your energy systems, then that is a definite no-no, all right? And one of the great things about that anatomical adaptation training is that, um, so long as you've been doing some amount of strength training, you're probably, you should not be getting sore after it, all right? And the only time you might be getting sore is if you've gone from doing absolutely nothing and you're doing it for the first time and maybe you're sore for that first couple days or maybe as much as a week after the first time you've introduced these exercises, even in a low volume. But if you've done this properly, then after that initial round of soreness, you should be able to continue with that adaptation strength training and not be sore on a day-to-day -day basis, all right? So the fatigue should not extend beyond the couple hours following the session itself. And then for the soreness with your other strength training, definitely with maximal strength lifting, where you're lifting between 85 and 100% of max in the, let's say, one to five or six rep range, then you should but not be getting enough reps to create the hypertrophy effect, which is gonna create the, uh, the soreness that you're gonna feel on a day-to-day -day basis with that lift. And talking about that hypertrophy, I wanna kinda of dive in because hypertrophy training is what you're gonna see the majority of uh, uninformed or uncoached athletes doing or gravitating to with strength training in the gym or on their own at home, wherever they may be doing it. Because hypertrophy training is gonna be characterized by lifting generally somewhere between the 60 and 80% of your max in the eight to 12 rep range. And so what that's gonna do is it's going, there's enough reps that you're, you're getting there and you can start to get, um, and you can really start to feel the effort where you're really struggling, but the weight is low enough that you can get a, several extra reps pushing through that fatigue and that pain for that feeling of accomplishment. And so, um, and then the other benefit of that is, is that hypertrophy training by nature, that, that, that sense of really pushing through the pain for those last several reps is really doing a lot of damage to your muscles. You're really tearing a lot of muscle fibers and the body's reaction to those tears is to really flood the site of those, that damage with a lot of water, all right? and that water is gonna create this swell effect, all right? So when you get that swole feeling after a hypertrophy lift, um, that is water kind of coming in and infusing with your muscles. And a lot of that water is gonna stay if you're doing a lot of hypertrophy training um, and you're gonna get bigger, all right? And certainly, you know, having coached youth, 
teenage boys, they love to look bigger, all right? And so they're gonna love that hypertrophy training for the effect it's gonna give them in um, helping with that look that they're trying to achieve um, and feeling better about themselves and their bodies. The problem is, is that all that water that you're putting into your muscles is not contributing to strength and speed. All it is is, is, is it's a size and it's an aesthetic. And so for rowers or any other endurance athletes, you really want to avoid that hypertrophy training and you really want to focus on maximal strength. All right, so that high percentage of your max, very low reps, which is going to create primarily a neuromuscular training effect where you're teaching your body to activate a larger percentage of the available muscle fibers um, on call, on demand. Um, and a good way to think about that is, you know, you hear stories a lot of kind of people um, in, a, in a high stress or an emergency situation, maybe, um, you know, something heavy is falling on a child and the parents suddenly gets this burst of strength and they can lift it off the child because of that adrenaline flooding into them. Well, in that situation, the, the parent hasn't taken their spinach or, or hulked out and suddenly changed their body. It's the exact same body, but the body naturally inhibits us from lifting very close to our max because there's a lot of risk for injury in doing so. But in those emergency situations, it will flood the body with that adrenaline and it will allow us to activate those muscle fires so that we can respond to that emergency situation, pick up that heavy load off that injured child, uh, to use that example, and, and then an hour later, once that adrenaline subsides, then you're back to kind of your normal strength. But that muscle is there, all right? And so with your maximal strength training, you're essentially training your body to activate a larger percentage of those available muscles without having to rely on that fight or flight instinct, on that flood of adrenaline that comes with a survival situation. And that is not going to break down the muscle fibers and the, where they're gonna develop a lot of hypertrophy, where they're gonna get infused. It's simply neuromuscular, all right? You're simply spending a lot of time lifting very close to that maximal ability to try to get the body used to it so the body is more open to allowing you to lift that higher percentage of your maximum in a normal situation. And then with muscular endurance, you're, it's exactly what it sounds like. With muscular endurance, you're generally lifting in the 30 to 100 reps range um, and you're just training your muscles to be able to lift a higher than normal load for a long period of time. And the value of this, um, there's debate on it. There's debate on whether it's, it's really valuable, uh, whether it's better spending that time um, training and, and rowing and just getting more time on the water versus training muscular endurance in the weight room. So I'm not gonna dive into that right now. But coming back to this idea of you don't wanna be sore. So one, you don't wanna be sore because one, it's a really good at, uh, indication that you're doing the wrong kind of strength training. Um, the other thing too is that if you're pushing yourself so far in a training session that you are carrying fatigue uh, day to day to the point where it's limiting your ability to perform, then that is not good, all right? Because your greatest training benefit is gonna come from, from sustainability, from consistency, from repeatability, all right? And so if you are overstressing your body to the point where that fatigue is carrying into um, other days, then it's gonna compromise your ability to work in those training sessions and it's gonna compromise your overall development. And I'll talk about this in another video because I think it's an important subject, but there's also a, a very important idea that I have that overstimulating a training adaptation does not produce a better benefit than simply inducing the minimum amount of a training adaptation. So what I'm trying to say is that lifting a little bit beyond your ability to kind of induce that muscle to adapt and to get used to the higher training load is not going to uh, you know, be different in the long term from really, really overstimulating that muscle and really getting it to maximal fatigue so that it's really sore and then it has to regenerate and then kind of going from that 
forward. I think that if you are consistently stimulating the body, whether it's with lifting and strength or whether it's aerobically or any other energy system, if you're consistently stimulating just beyond your ability, your threshold, recovering and then doing that again, stimulating just a little bit beyond what you're used to, recovering, doing again. If you're constantly doing that, constantly just giving a little stimulus to the body right at the edge of your ability and then recovering, then in the long term you're going to get a vastly superior training benefit than if you do a super hard lift session or super hard aerobic session or super hard anaerobic session um, and then you have to go through a much longer recovery from that and then come back and do it again. So those are the three and so we have one timing all right don't do your don't do your lifting right before an aerobic session because you don't want to weaken your stabilizing muscles that are going to be important for a reducing injury during that aerobic session two um, you can get a huge amount of benefit with a very little amount of lifting um, and so maybe adding 20 30 maybe as much as 40 minutes twice a week after your after your primary training session is going to give you probably 60 to 70 percent of the available training benefits and so you should definitely do this you know for any um athlete at any level even if you're training twice a week if you're training twice a week if you're rowing twice a week spend 10 to 20 minutes at the end of that session doing some bodyweight squats doing some push-ups doing some core work and that will give you a lot of proportional return for your investment of time. And then finally, don't lift to the point that you're getting sore and that soreness is carrying you through multiple days, all right? That does not include maybe those first couple days if you're going from doing nothing or you're, or you're, going, you're doing a type of lift for the very first time um, and you might be sore in that first couple days, maybe as much as a week um, when you're just getting into it. But once you get past that initial uh, phase of soreness at the very beginning of your training cycle, you should not be sore from your lifts. That means that you're overstimulating that training, uh, overdoing that training stimulus um, to where it's gonna impact your ability to be consistent uh, with that training over time. And uh, that's it. That's our session, all right? So a little bit longer one, but a lot of great content. I was actually really excited to talk about this with you guys because I think it's extraordinarily helpful and I think a lot of people don't understand the best way to use uh, strength training uh, as endurance athletes. So that is it. Um, if you guys can help the channel by sharing this with other people that you think would benefit from this information, uh, subscribe to the channel by hitting that button down below. If you would like to see more content like this, if you hit the bell notification after you subscribe, you will get an email whenever I upload a new video. Uh, like, put a, give a thumbs up if you like this video. If you have questions, please put them in the comments below. Um, I've been, I have had enough time lately to respond to almost all of those questions, I think, and I'm happy to share that information um, and kind of explore those other inquiries that you guys have, or maybe if I didn't explain something uh, too well in the video, I can kind of cover my basis down there. But that's it. Thanks a lot for listening. I really hope this, uh, this information helps you guys and uh, elevate your performance moving forward. And uh, that's it. So this is Travis signing off. Take care guys and I'll see you in the next video.